pick up on some of the matters dealing with the medical aspects of vitamin D. As you look at the literature on vitamin D, so much is coming out now. Look at this. This is from 18 random controlled trials that have been reviewed that vitamin D supplemented. You can imagine it, what it would be if we actually got it the way God intended us to, but even supplementing with vitamin D significantly reduces all-cause mortality for all diseases. Emphasizing the medical, ethical, legal implications of promptly diagnosing and adequately treating vitamin D deficiency states. Not only are such deficiencies common and probably the rule, and if any of you have checked your vitamin D or if you're in the healthcare profession and you're screening people, it's almost, it's the majority of people. I wouldn't say it's 100%, but it's way up there of people whose vitamin D levels are inadequate for health. Their vitamin D deficiency now implicated in most of the diseases of modern civilization. It really isn't a vitamin, it's a steroid hormone. It stimulates these vitamin D receptors that God has placed in the cell nucleus and regulating more than 200 human genes in a wide variety of tissues, all of which help to maintain normal body function and physiology. Let's look at symptoms and signs of vitamin D inadequacy or deficiency. What would be the most common? Okay. In childhood, right. Uh -huh. Muscle weakness. Then if you're just doing screens, you may have low serum calcium levels, you know, on metabolic screens. If you happen to look at parathyroid levels, parathyroid glands or little glands that sit up here in the neck, embedded in the thyroid, and they help maintain calcium metabolism. And if you are vitamin D deficient, then these glands start to sense a lowering of that calcium, and they begin to respond by putting out parathormone. And so this is what is called secondary hyperparathyroidism. And this is where you're going to start getting bone disease osteoporosis, osteomalacia, these things, because of inadequate intake of vitamin D and calcium, mostly vitamin D. You can get localized bone pain, and that is not associated with osteoporosis, but osteomalacia, and we'll talk about that term in a minute. And then here are your, the, the thinning of the normal bone uh, material structure, and then you can get fractures. But people may not ever equate some of their feelings of weakness, fatigue, whatever, with vitamin D unless you, it's checked. Um, you see this bone pain, where is that localized bone pain, weakness, and so forth. Many of the patients that were previously diagnosed with fibromyalgia are now recognized to have vitamin D deficiency symptoms. There again, low serum calcium level. As you activate parathormone levels, you'll get low phosphorus levels, numbness, tingling sensations, cramps, spasms of the larynx, that's the voice box. And actually, you can, if it gets low enough, you can actually have frank seizures, spastic states. Let's look at those individuals that would be at high risk for this. The elderly. Vitamin D production by the skin decreases by as much as 75% by the age of 70 years. 
those that are chronically ill and kept indoors, malnourished. Obesity is a risk factor for vitamin D deficiency because vitamin D is deposited in the large body fat stores, has not been readily bioavailable. And those that have limited sunlight exposure, those persons who are darkly pigmented, they require three to six times more sun exposure to get the same levels of hydroxy vitamin D. Those with a history of kidney disease, liver failure, bypass <laughs> procedures, malabsorption syndromes, and certain medications can impair um, the metabolism of vitamin D. But let's don't look at all these little isolated. We're going to see here what is the most common problem for people that are basically don't have all of these things, this rest, but just the, you know, the older people, sure, the darkly pigmented. But where are we going to get the vitamin D? How are we going to get it? And let's look and see. The Lord intended, I believe, for us to get our vitamin D by sunlight exposure. Um, if you look at the average age person, if you get him or her out in the sun with a pretty good, like a sun tanning exposure for about 15 minutes uh, of sunlight, summertime, middle of the day, you'll generate about 10,000 international units of vitamin D just by the skin. 30 minutes, 20,000. Now that's for a lighter, complected person. So you can see that this would provide 90 to 95% of the individual's needs, and then the dietary sources, which are limited, will show you those, and then the supplements, the D2 and D3. Here are your dietary sources, and you can see that it's not a lot. Salmon, mackerel, sardines, cod liver oil, egg yolks, milk, cereals, orange juices that are fortified. But look at that. I mean, that's like very little, 100 international units. Some yogurts, some margarines. So you can see that the dietary source is rather limited, especially for the vegetarian population. Let's look a little bit at the metabolism. Um, that's a busy slide, isn't it? Uh, let's just see if we can simplify and just say that, you know, when the sunlight strikes the skin, there are these cholesterol precursors that are activated and then make this cholecalciferol, which is the vitamin D3. This is what the mammalian uh, group make in their skin. Okay, D3. It's animals, man, right? The sun exposure to the skin. <laughs> the supplements will either be D2 or D3, and D2 comes from irradiated plant material, yeast, and so forth. If you get supplements in D3, it usually comes from sheep wool, the lanolin that has been irradiated. Right? Um, and whether it's D2 or D3, this is called a vitamin D. And they can both be used by the body to make what the serum measurement of vitamin D, which we call 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So, bigger term, calcidiol, but it's, this is what we measure when we say, let's get a vitamin D level, all right? We get the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, and there is good evidence that D3 in the same doses increases the serum levels of vitamin D much more than D2. D2 is probably about one third as effective as D3 in elevating serum hydroxy. Uh, we've talked about this is the predominant circulating form of vitamin D. And as it's circulating, as it goes to the kidneys, there's further hydroxylation that occurs. 
and then uh, you 